Well, I have a wonderful electronic invention I want you to see. It, it looks something like this. Welcome to the CTO Studio. I'm your host, Etienne de Bruin. The CTO Studio is where we chat with CTOs building amazing products with incredible teams. Have you chatted with a CTO lately? Dan, welcome to the CTO Studio. Thank you, Etienne. So great to be here. You and I were talking about top five lists yes we were and a top five list is 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 what was that so we were talking about friendships and relationships and certainly i appreciate the friendship that we've shared and the professional relationship we have so thank you for having me here i love what you're doing at seven ctos i love your mission in life and i love your friendship so thank you and so we were talking about you know how does one build relationships how does one maintain relationships and so i had mentioned that i have a top five and they're just, there are five people. And I had heard this, I don't remember where I heard this wisdom, but that it's uh, difficult to maintain continuity of relationships. And if, if a person has five of them in their life, five friends in their life that they talk to on a regular basis, that's a very fortunate person. And so I feel fortunate because I have those five people. So I, um, I, sometimes I feel sorry for myself and I say, why doesn't anybody ever reach out to me for a change? Because I am a, a raging extrovert. <laughs> <laughs> but I do have those moments where I think, uh, man, uh, why, isn't, why isn't someone just texting me and saying, what's up, dude? So then I overcame that um, about 10 or so days ago. And I decided to text a few people that is on this proverbial top five list and just say, hey, Tell me something special about your day as opposed to like, hey, what's up or how are you doing? But just like, hey, tell me something that was special about your day. And all those people responded. Isn't that shocking? It's, it, it's wonderful. No, I'm, I'm not terribly shocked. You're a very affable man. And I, <clears throat> I think that anyone would want to respond. What I found is that um, when people reach out to me, I'm always happy to hear from them. And I get entrenched and busy in life like we all do and often I forget to reach out to certain people and I <clears throat> I um so now I do now if, uh, if I think of someone I just reach out yeah and I think that's what uh the joy of text or is that you can just when you do think of someone you can just shoot a message yeah now uh two I think three of those people responded by saying the best part of my day was this text from you. <laughs> Wonderful. Now, do you think that that's just because they didn't know what to say, or do you think they, do, do people really feel that way? I, I think people, I think I, you know, I would take them um, at text value, and I, I think people really do feel that way. I, I'm, like I said, I'm always happy when people reach out to me, especially if someone I haven't talked to in a long time. And so, um, again, I think we just all get very busy, and um, the relationship part of our life is ultimately the most re most important and the most rewarding, I, I think. And so I think uh, we just get too busy. Yeah, so I think the top five, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to work really hard at that. Excellent. Anyway, so welcome to the show. Thank you. Um, I'm extremely lucky and happy to have you, uh, especially because we were talking about how as we are growing older and, and sort of more uh focused on our sort of outcomes and our careers we tend to not have that many more people that come alongside us and can actually say oh yeah i i've been with you these last five ten years and so dan i remember we had sushi the first time we met and mm -hmm. i was telling you about this crazy idea called seven ctos yeah. and i think at that point i still thought that uh, you could be a member of it and then i just I think into the tuna nigiri, I realized this man is the master and I am the student. Mm. Well, well, thank you for saying that. <laughs> That's very kind of you to say that. Um, it was a great pleasure when I first met you. And at that time, you were doing very interesting things and always seeking to do more interesting things. And you have done them. And I, again, I appreciate how far you've come. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. So um, I wanted to... I wanted to touch on something that you did. Uh, so you've spoken at our CTO gatherings a few times. 
And there was this one uh, time you spoke with us while you were the chief innovation officer at a school district. And um, I wanted to... I wanted you to sort of try and repeat the thing you said, which really you sort of offhand described your career going from, from, from an engineer, analytical, scientific, and you kind of did it in sort of the ones, you started with current, ones sure. and zero, and you took it all the way up to where you are today. Sure. And I just thought it was such an eloquent way to describe it, and I'm not asking you to dramatize it, but if you could just give us that to where you are today, that would be awesome. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> thank you. And I do think about that often. I, it's, it's hard to describe it as a career path or a career trajectory. And it certainly <clears throat> wasn't planned as a career. I would call it more of a personal mission of understanding. And so I believe that a big part of my personal being is to understand the world I live in. And so, of course, I was fascinated with computers like we all were when we were young or many of us here, certainly at seven CTOs. And so I started um, trying to figure out how to build and design them. And I went uh, to college and got a micro electronic engineering design degree. It's how you design, how silicon becomes chips and silicon becomes transistors and transistors becomes chips and so on and so forth. <clears throat> so I designed transistors and chips uh, and then circuit boards. And at each stage, I tried to understand how the things fit together. And so of course, software fits on top of circuit boards or the circuit boards don't do anything. And then at some point you get to, how do you design the software? How do you build the software? And so you get to project management, you get to program management, uh, you get to um, product design, you get to customer and use cases, you get to, eventually you get to business strategies, leadership and psychology. And so I feel like my personal passion and mission has been to try and understand the world I live in. But I started with this fascination with, um, you know, electrons and how they flow through a circuit. And I finally got to a place where I'm still trying to understand the world I live in. Um, and as I had mentioned to you right before the show, I just completed uh, my doctorate in psychology and it's an industrial organizational psychology. And I'm trying to uh, understand, I'm still trying to understand the world I live in. And, and to continue to learn. And now I've gotten to a place where I feel as though, I think ob an obvious place for probably people who were smarter than me when I was younger, but the obvious place of, you know, if you don't, uh, if you don't understand psychology, if you don't understand people, influence, persuasion, and motivation, uh, then you're not gonna get anything done. Yeah, that uh, uh, I often, when I talk to uh, people who move from, from technical uh, and, and individual contributor positions to, to leadership and management positions, I kind of go from, you're, you're going from programming computers to, to programming people. And of course, programming people isn't leadership really, uh, maybe it is, but the, the gentle art of persuasion that is the programming people, like you said, the influence Whereas if, if you go further down to programming computers, it's more, you know, running through cycles fast enough so that you can uh, uncover problems and then just go and fix it with sort of that immediate uh, gratification. Whereas with a human, you know, it's just a whole different ball game. Yeah, they, they make decisions on their own. Yeah. So Sentient beings. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, it, and, and so... And, and so maybe to, maybe to dig into that a little bit, Love to. so, you know, how does that all work? And I, I, I guess I'm even, um, a little nervous about saying influence and persuasion in the workplace, maybe motivation, but because I don't, I guess I believe in servant leadership. I believe in supporting others. And I believe that each person, um, does make their own decisions and all you can do is set up an arena where they can be successful. And so I'm a big proponent of, um, the, the the book Drive, uh, Dan Daniel Pink. Daniel right? Pink, yeah. yeah. I don't know. Are you familiar with Drive? And yes, yes. So the so the three pillars that he yes. talks about are autonomy, mastery, and purpose. And so um, you know, so as a as a as a as a leader tr trying to understand these things, I guess I don't think of it as leadership as much as um, servantship. And if you can set up an arena where people feel a great degree of autonomy and they feel a great degree of mastery and have the proper training uh, and understand their profession, and you can align their work to the mission of the organization, 
um, the rest takes care of itself. I really, I think that's a, just a phenomenal take on, 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 you know, quote unquote, how to be a leader, but really you're on, you're on the, if you're a good leader, you're, you're on the side, you're not in front of people. Yeah. And it was interesting for me in my mm-hmm. journey, um, the, uh, real, the realization I had that people are not just as, as when I became the quasi CTO of my startup and, uh, to realize that the people that I was hiring wasn't there to be an extension of me because I only had 10 fingers. And if I hired two more people, I would have 30 fingers, three, you know, three heads. And therefore I could increase my throughput, but that I was actually hiring two humans, like you said, that think for themselves, have their own ideas. And that the best thing I could do was to, you know, get out of the way in a way to activate their creativity and 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 actually harness that that uh, creativity to make our products better, as opposed to just seeing them as machines that would go through my backlog or my to do list and just get stuff done while I was focused on on the other part of the system. And 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 while it's a it's a bit of a Feels like a bit of a cliche when you say it, but it was. I remember it was a massive moment for me where, I, when I realized this. And, yeah, and I think for many of us, again, who started engineering, it's a bit of an epiphany at some point. I I would hope, and it was for me. And so, you know, again, this this track that I've been on the last few years of trying to investigate industrial and organizational psychology is um, how do you garner that leverage to maximal degree you, and, and how do you set up the playing field? So um, the example of you know, industrial organizational psychology, and psychology is not that old of a field. I mean, it's really about, I don't know, 150 years old. And during the Industrial Revolution, people started to say, gee, how can we make widgets faster, better, cheaper, and how can we get people better in alignment uh, with, our, with our productivity goals? And so organizational psychology is how do you set up Let's say you had a baseball team. So organizational psychology is how would you set up the game field, um, the rules and the regulations, and how are the umpires going to treat the field, and what what does the field look like is kind of organizational psychology. And industrial psychology is stereotypically how do you um, treat each individual player? What does Etienne Mm -hmm. need to be successful specifically? And so this is kind of this, this hand in glove of industri- that's why it's industrial and organizational psychology, IO psychology, is because they go hand in glove. So, but they, so organizational psychology is sort of, is it around the, adv- the advantage? The game the, rules. Yeah, so it's, it's organizational design. And does each, is there sort of a best practice across the board for how this is done? Or is it dependent upon the growth of is is it is it company specific is it organization specific well it well so that's there's uh, there's a plethora, plethora plethora of research now and examples out there but what people research is you know what kind of culture do you set up and how much does it make a difference what kind of org chart do you set up and how much does it make a difference uh, what does the game field look like um, what are your rules for compensation role responsibility bonusing or not pay or not um, uh, so it's the organizational structure. And, and, is, what, and my question is, is that as the research is maturing and uncovering and as we have more empirical data, is it all, my, is it all moving towards a single best practice that is proving to be successful in organizations of certain sizes or... Yeah, does the pharmaceutical industry have a way they do things? SaaS companies have a way they do things. You know, peach distribution companies have a way they do things. And for each of those, there is a, you just have to figure it out depending on how the company was founded, what industry they're in, what their outcome goals are. Is, that, is, is it that? So, so that's a great question, especially because we're coming from the viewpoint of seven CTOs, and we've both been CTOs. And I think from a technological perspective, uh, industry can make a difference in terms of what technologies you employ. 
what types of workflows you employ and processes and procedures you employ because there can be great nuance in a particular industry. What I find fascinating about psychology and leadership is that I think it's more cohesive than that. Um, and that's why I love Daniel Pink because I've read hundreds, if not thousands of research papers on organizational performance. And what I loved about his book is he, he boils it down so simply to autonomy, mastery, and purpose, which I do believe aligns perfectly with all the research I've seen of how you set up a successful workplace for employees. That's fascinating also because I'm reflecting on how um, a, lot of, a lot of companies, startups that mature into, uh, let's say, rev- revenue-generating companies. So, and, and by startups, let's talk about the zero to 100 million range. Uh, well, if you're in the, the zero to five million range, you're starting to face certain organizational pressure mm-hmm. from five to 25, certain organizational pressure. And oftentimes, um, you know, in, 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 in our world, there's this talk about, well, the CTO in the organization goes from perhaps uh, the the, the center of the technology strategy, the center of the technology implementation, uh, the, the builder of the team uh, process, uh, then, then, needs to, then needs to carve out this position called the VP of engineering, who then comes alongside, takes over many of the day-to-day duties, and then so that the CTO can keep, it, keep their eye on the puck you know, to where it's going, maybe have some R and D and sort of move out towards the business side of things. I'm I I it's interesting for me how how CTOs as they're growing struggle with sort of bringing in that middle management or that that uh, those additional team members in order to sustain the growth of the organization. Have you have you seen that or do you have any thoughts on that? Well, yes. Absolutely. <laughs> and I've, I've had a great failure in my own career, and I hope I've learned from that. And I think one of my failures of understanding was that, um, and I think we've all probably um, you know, had to step over this one, is that a great engineer is not a great manager, and they're completely opposite. So I was a great engineer, or at least I like to think I was a good engineer. And so when I was um, designing a chip or a circuit or a board of some kind that had, you know, 10 or 20 million transistors in it, if one transistor was out of place, the whole thing could fail. And so as an engineer, and same thing with software, when I wrote software, anyone who's written software, if you're writing software that, you know, has 5 million lines of code, if a semicolon's out of place, the whole thing can crash. And so as an engineer, you're rewarded for finding needles in a haystack. And as a leader, to me, it's exactly the opposite. Mm. It, the, the needles don't matter. What matters is the haystack. And so how you, um, how you can converse, how you can traverse um, the business arena, the political arena, the leadership arena, doesn't have to do with the tiny nuances. It has to do with... Um, people and relationships. And so to me, it's an absolutely opposite end of the spectrum skill set. And I think one of the most challenging professional growth paths to take is that of a technical professional. Well, I'm about to, I'm about to riff on that with yeah. you. All right. Is, is, it, is it a, uh, is it, are, are we focused on the wrong? And by, by wrong, I mean, is, have we been doing it wrong all this time to ask technical geniuses who around whom a startup success was founded because of their technology prowess and to ask them to become the leader of 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 men and women and and people it's, it's, is, is I, that it feels like an unnatural progression I, I think it is i think it's an unbelievably high hurdle <clears throat> and some obviously some technical leaders have done very well there but I think, I think it's, it's an extreme challenge. Fascinating. 
Who should be the CTOs then? <laughs> well, that's a great question. I, 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 I like the way you described um, company growth, and I think it probably does make a, a, an enormous difference how large the company is and what the role and responsibility of the CTO is. Um, and um, I don't think we've ever talked about the difference between a CTO and a CIO, and I'd love to get your take on that. And and your take maybe on corporate size versus those two roles Actually, and responsibilities. Actually, no, no. And this is a great topic to have and something that I haven't gone on record with for, okay. for fear of retribution. Okay. <laughs> we could stay away from it if it's necessary. No, no, no. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Um, so I'd, I'd love to uh, – so CIO as in Chief Information Officer. Yes. So uh, I would love to dig into this. Um, the elevator pitch. So when I started seven CTOs, obviously the first question was, well, can CIOs join as well? Um, why isn't it seven CIOs? And in fact, I think I own seven CIOs.com. But the, uh, and I'll never forget this. I had literally had this conversation in an elevator in Portland on our way up to this exclusive suite have you ever been to the Portland Bar and Grill? I have not. It is an amazing old school restaurant with an incredible view of Portland. So we were on our way to this place and uh, I was in the elevator before the doors even closed. The guy said to me, well, I'm a CIO and am I welcome? And, and then I said, of course you are. And then someone else chipped in and said, well, you know, he's not a CTO. Ha ha ha. So. This is how I like to view it. I like to say that a CIO is someone who uses resources to optimize and ultimately save and cut down cost for a, an organization, a technology organization. Or it could be another one. But basically, it's someone who is, 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 is assessing and optimizing and constantly putting IT and information systems in place um, in order to help the business run, help the business learn from data, help the business to, to grow um, in that way. So I would say CIO uses technology to save money. I think the CTO of, it, of traditional SaaS and technology companies is using technology to make money. In other words, how do we use data? How do we build systems in order to create revenue? Mm -hmm. Well, thank goodness we're in agreement so we can still be friends. Because <laughs> I've always thought of <clears throat> CIO as internally focused and yeah. CTO as externally yeah, focused. You said it so eloquently. <laughs> well, good. I'm glad we're in accord. Yeah, and oh, I, and Then I, we can finish the conversation. <laughs> And so, obviously, if you are the CIO of a, let's say, of a platform as a service company, of course, you could be, in fact, I think it makes more sense for CTO, let's talk about mega corporations, it would make sense for me that the CTO would report into the CIO uh, if, 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 if that was happening um, at any way. I know in many organizations, the CTO might report in or be accountable to the CFO in some cases, depending on the makeup of the organization. But um, yes, there are cases where the CIO uh, is tooled and geared towards, hey, how do, we, how do we take this process optimization, this thing that we've learned, and how do we use it to generate revenues? But yes, I would say CIO uses money, uses tech to save money, and CTO uses tech to make money. So I agree with you. And I, I would argue that the CIO could report to um, lower echelons of the company, like a CFO, because it's about cost cutting and it is more in alignment with financial management, financial controls. And a CTO, I would argue, should be have a seat at the strategy table. So true. Because that role and responsibility, at least in, in my mind, it sounds like, again, we're in accord, is to advance the business practices, advance the products, advance the services, advance the revenue, 
and to potentially dramatically change the opportunities for those companies. That so to is, me, the CTO should be at the C table. And that is one of the core missions of seven CTOs is to help bring that role of CTO to the table as a first-class citizen. And you know, it's interesting for me how many people are in the role of CTO but don't have that. Yeah. And I think that it's twofold. One, because you came up through the ranks as an engineer, as someone who is implementing specs, someone who's finding the needles in the haystack, um, and we spoke about this a bit earlier, where you're, you're coming in a bit more supportive, and I can perform miracles as long as you tell me what that miracle needs to be. Uh, so I think it's, it's got something to do with how you come up the ranks, and then it has something to do with how your CEO views you as, well, I've always asked her to uh, build me stuff, and I'm just going gonna, gonna to make her CTO, but I'm going to keep asking her to just build stuff. And I think that that reinforces an identity that, that, that it doesn't serve the business on a strategic level because you're still just really seeing the CTO as the, you, now you go off and you go do this, as opposed to come sit at the table and help guide strategy. You have the authority you we need you to help us decide where this company is going and i think that many ctos don't see themselves that way and or many ceo c suites don't see their cto that way and i think that is a super gray area that we're in as we're transitioning into this sort of new age i, I absolutely agree with you and and then it makes me wonder how does a cto if a CTO comes up through a growing company that had deep technical roots and they were the deep technical person that enabled those products to be successful and designed and built in the first place, how is it that they transition in a large organization as an organization grows to have a, having a um, more understanding, more knowledge, and a bigger purview? If, if they're going to be at the table, they need to have those skill sets. How is it that those skill sets are built around um, you know, the, the external business strategies, the market, the pricing strategies, the, the customer needs, and how is it those things that they transition to focusing more externally on those? And so I, I think, it, again, I think it's just an enormous challenge in our industry. 7CTOs.com. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. We aren't going to need any ads for this episode because I've taken up all the ad space. There you go. So, so, so you mentioned, you know, how do they do that? And of course I mentioned that I've had some troubles with that. And one of the things I was hoping to bring up, cause we did get on this thread that I was thinking earlier was, um, the, the New York times. So we talked about this deep technical person. Um, and then the, of course the stereotypical engineer, um, un, much unlike yourself, but the stereotypical engineer doesn't have those, the highly developed social skills that maybe we're looking in some of our um, higher level leadership in the in these organizations, my as social they skills are transcendental. <laughs> they're, they're phenomenal. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so the stereotypical engineer doesn't doesn't have those uh, those people skills as much. And so, the New York Times wrote an article. Gosh, this is probably a couple of years ago uh, that just so resonated with me. And it, it was called the article was a, a psychology article about it was called the destructive hero. And I fallen victim to that a couple of times where I've had the strongest, smartest, could fix anything engineer on my team and I promote him to manager. And there's, it's rough, you know, I, again, this is kind of a generalization, but I've seen this happen and I, I would have, the management was rough. The, the, some people complained, but everything still got done and it got done better, faster, cheaper. And there was, some conflict, but he, but the manager still made things happen and much of it was hands on. And I thought this is the best, smartest person I've got. And then as I grew, I made a, made this person director and, um, I have failed that way three or four times because inevitably what has happened to me is that that person has to become, has to transition from hands off technical person to people person. And I have seen that fail over and over again. And 
that's why personally I'm still confused about it. I'm still going to school to try and learn how to do this. <laughs> and I've been in the industry, you know, a couple decades. And so I think it's, a, again, for me, it was a very difficult transition. Um, I, I hope I'm getting better at it. Um, but I, I don't think it's something where you can just flip a switch and say, okay, now you're a manager, go manage. And I've, I failed many times um, uh, trying to promote people internally in that regard. And, and, and here is the... Um here is the unstoppable force that hits the immovable rock. And that is, I often listen to people who say, you know, I'm 20 years into software development. I just want to be a coder. I, 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 I love coding. I'm an, I love being an individual contributor. I, I'm, I, this is what I want to do. And and I think that is the immovable rock, but I think the unstoppable force is you have 20 years of experience. You, 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 you have to help people. You have something that, the, I mean, let's say, for instance, you are the world's number one expert on uh, serverless architecture, okay, because you were there from day one. People coming in today probably are, especially ones who are passionate about serverless architectures, um, might come in and, 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 and off the top of their head know as much as you do. But what is the one massive difference between the person coming in and the person who is 20 years deep? It's this little E word called experience. Yeah. So don't you think that engineers who... Um, are at the top of their game and have demonstrated their time-tested ability to solve problems, have a responsibility towards society to become leaders of, of people? So on this, I feel like we might diverse just do a it. little let's, bit. Let's do it. So, so again, I want to be your best friend. But I might have a little difference of opinion here. Well, you've just gone from top 15 <laughs> into my top 10. Excellent, excellent. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go the other direction now, probably. <laughs> so um, so I, I think it's okay. So, um, gosh, one of the old adages, you know, this is old, gosh, old stuff um, uh, from Jim Clark, you know, uh, I, I believe was the first time I heard this quote in one of his books, you know, the Netscape you know, old, the old, the old guys, the old guard of technology. And I remember in his book, it was quoted that a great engineer is worth 10 really good engineers. And so if you have a person who is an exceptional engineer and they love doing it, I guess I would fall in the camp that would say, that's fantastic. Let them keep doing it. Um, and again, if you think about, when I think about you know, autonomy, mastery, and purpose. And I think about how to set up that playing field so everyone can be successful and how to support the individual so the individuals can be successful within that arena. Those aren't technical skills. Um, and so um, I would probably go down a little different path and put a little more emphasis on the fact that um, I'm not sure that 22 years of experience as a brilliant software engineer necessarily will translate well into leadership, maybe some sort of technical leadership, maybe some sort of agile peer review process, maybe some mentoring process, but to actually take that person and put them at, you know, ultimate, I mean, manager, hands on manager. But if they go to, once they go to a director <clears throat> at a more sizable comp company, or certainly if they're going to sit at the C suite table, <clears throat> to me, it's a completely different skill set. But is, so I, I agree with you on that. I think, um, the the differentiator for me would be are you a technical person who is attracted to business mechanics and the business side or are you just someone who is really you, you want to stay on the technical track mm -hmm. and i think that's okay i think um i don't think you have to want to be on the business side but i do think that there is leadership that is required of you is due to the fact that you have experience to just to just shut yourself off to the world and say i like what i'm doing i like to put on the headphones i i'm not in so and i think this is in the mastery side because 
part of the mastery is the ability to um, teach, yeah, right? To mentor, yeah. And so uh, that does come with a certain level of it has to be empathy or some level of desire to, to, to transfer knowledge. So I think that's sort of baked in, in a way for me. It doesn't mean that you have to, not saying all technical people have to become business people, which I think it happens to be the CTO, by the way. The, I love technology. I'm also really interested in how to leverage that and build a business. I think that to me is the path of the CTO. But I think that as far as leadership goes, those, uh, the autonomy, mastery, and purpose is all soft skills that I think just have to be instilled and nurtured and grown early on so that when they do become those neckbeards at 20 and 30 years of experience, that they have something to give back. That it's so, not just technology. Well, yeah, and I would be hopeful that that is the case, that someone who has such extreme mastery of profession would want to mentor and share that. I don't know that all the engineers, wonderful engineers I've met, are in that camp. Some people do just like to sit in a room and crank out wonderful code. Uh, I would hope that they would want to mentor, and I think that would be better for organization and organizational culture, and I would certainly try and steward that and set up or set up the game field so that could happen. Um, and people could opt into that. Um, but again, it's, um, it's, again, it's just, you know, all of these tangents are how difficult it is to transition to, to that top role with the seat at the table. You know, the other thing I want to ask you, and again, rhetorically is maybe it's the wrong title. Maybe CTO is the wrong title because the business people I know, when they think of the chief technical person, they think of chief technical problems. Mm. And that's not really how you and I see it, having, been, having done our own businesses, having done our own startups, having been in business, have, being that advisor. We see it very, very mm. differently. We see it as a business-centric, externally focused yes. role that's going to advise and extend opportunity in the marketplace. Yes. And, 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 but, but, but what we're telling business people is, I'm the chief technology officer. And so it's huh. in, so so I'm just thinking that as we're having this conversation, maybe it's the wrong title. Maybe we should change the title. <laughs> er- Eric loves that idea. Okay. <laughs> That's very interesting. You, you're we, right. We, because we, need, we need we need better marketing. No, but it's because we're saying we're saying yes. I think that is a very interesting point. Yeah. So um, huh? Okay. I wanna I wanna I wanna segue. We've been uh, dancing at the top of the food chain. I'd love to get to the proverbial bottom of the food chain. I know it's a passion we both share very deeply, which is the innovation that is education and educating maybe the, the, the unreachable, the, 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 the young ones. The, I want to really get to that. As a segue to that, I want to ask you, um, if you could maybe share a productivity tip, can you tell us something about Dan, Doctor Dan? How did that sound? Yeah, it sounds great. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, is there something that you do in your day, in your morning, in your week, that just like you're maintaining this top five list of friendships to keep yourself grounded in relationships? that you do around productivity that that you feel like you could share as a tip? Yeah, I think it's a great question. I, everyone's different. So for me, if uh, I'm a very physical being, and I, if I don't move, I don't feel set. I don't feel like I have an even keel. And so I, um, I feed myself first, and then the rest of the day is for everyone else. So a typical day for me, especially if it's a super busy day, would start early. And so I get up very early and four o'clock. Uh, no, I'm not, I'm not part of the, 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 uh, hashtag 445 club, but is there but really I, a hashtag? Oh yeah. Oh, absolutely. Oh yeah. Look it up. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's, um, one of the local, I, I heard a podcast by one of the local, uh, Navy SEALs and who promoted that. And there's a whole bunch of people on there who wow. get start their day at 445 often with a workout. And so there, there have been times when I've done that, but the typical day would be get up at maybe 4.45 or 5, go to a 5.30 to 6.30 swim session, and then go to work. And if I do that, and I do that, I, I walk my dog, and then I do that first hour for myself, 
and I kind of set my body into a calm groove for just my physical being and my physical sense, then I can spend the rest of the day trying to help everyone else on everyone else's problems, on the business problems, on the people problems. It doesn't matter to me because in the first thing in the morning, I set my course. I did what I felt was good for myself. I made myself feel good. <clears throat> Took an hour. You know, that one, I do an hour in the pool. Um, and then I'm fine. If I have to spend whatever up into the late night with everyone else solving their issues, I'm completely happy with that. And what does, what does that do f- mentally? Do you have some sort of mental exercise you go through uh, as well? Or is it just the mere fact that you're focusing on the strenuous physical exercise that you don't have to process anything else and you're just focused on sort of a singular task? Or do you have some sort of mental discipline as well? So I don't have any particular... I am awesome. I am awesome. Yeah. I am awesome. I am awesome. <laughs> yeah. I don't have any particular mental discipline. It's interesting to me if I move physically vigorously for an hour, uh, it just calms my soul. And I, there is, I find swimming very meditative because it's, you're, it's quiet, you're in the water. And so I do find it kind mm. of a meditative experience, mm. but I don't focus on anything in particular. Mm. I'm usually just processing the, the, the day previous. Just do you believe in affirmations? Um, Self-affirmations. I do, and that's a practice I should probably do more of. I think that's a wonderful practice. I don't, I don't do that. I, uh, have you heard of the book Morning Miracle? Yes. So yeah. they, it's good stuff. It's good stuff. Yeah. There's something to be said for putting the mask on yourself before putting it on your loved ones because... Absolutely. Dot, dot, dot. Yeah, absolutely. So let's, let's go... Just briefly into um, um, innovation in education for young kids. I have I have three youngish kids. They all love their iPads. Um, I've taught them how to self-regulate, which is incredible. Mm-hmm. You can do the iPad anytime. I don't care when you do it, how you do it, what you do it, as long as you regulate yourself. Boom. Yeah. I don't have to worry about it. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, so I'm teaching them the skill of regulation as opposed to the skill of, well, reward and, you know, uh, a timer and stuff. But that's a different point. Uh, the education apps on there, unbelievable. I think the benefits, amazing. Um, but can you maybe just, as we close this out, just drop maybe two or three things that you are maybe observing about children and technology and how how that is how that affects education and uh and and what what can we do as you know cto types who are at the other end of the spectrum uh you know do we all go buy five laptops and, and dump them on the kids is that good is that bad uh do we sacrifice our saturday mornings to go sit cross legged and and speak to kids about problem solving uh, so what are you seeing? Uh, what kind of innovation excites you in that space? Mm. And then what can we do uh, as a collective to maybe get involved? Well, so great question. And this, as you know, this is a deep area of interest and passion of mine. And we could do another couple hours on this. <clears throat> but um, I'll try and be, um, be, be a little bit terse to respect the time. And maybe we can do do another session on this. Thank you. There's there's so my, much. My plan works. Yeah. There's so much. There's so much there. Um. So I guess one of the things that I've learned, um, because I did work as a chief innovation officer of large local school district, and I did spend the last seven years looking at the research in the space at that intersection of psychology, technology, and education, and particularly when it comes to putting mobile devices in front of children and the applications on those devices and the content and the pedagogy that goes along with those devices. So there's a lot there. But one of the things that um, was a misnomer to me that I heard from so many people, um, politicians, educators, parents, is that um, children, young children need to play. Young children don't need to sit in front of a screen. Young children don't need technology. Maybe when they, certainly when they get to high school, because they're going to have to prepare for college and maybe at middle school, but they don't need it earlier in that. And certainly something like a kindergartner could never, um, could never have uh, advantages from technology because they haven't even learned their alphabet yet. And how can they even log into the computer? And one of the things I learned in the research and in my own programs and my own research is that 
the younger the better. To ha- the, you have the most leverage with children the younger they are to experience new learning opportunities. And as, an ex- as a quick example, one of the pieces of research that I'm a big fan of is now about 20 years old, but it's a piece of research by Risley and Hart. And it, the research was, how early does the achievement gap happen? And so as, ed- as, as, a, as a wannabe educator trying to help out in this field, I was very curious about that. And so their research showed, and they, and, and they, they looked at um, young children from birth to four years old, and they looked at um, socioeconomically disadvantaged families and how many words those children heard in those homes and the types of words to um, middle-class families and how many words those children heard growing up, zero to four years old, and to affluent, highly educated families. And what they found is that a child from zero to four years old in America from a uh, both ed- college educated parents, more affluent family, hears about on well, here's on average 47 million words by the time they're four years old and they enter preschool. The middle class families heard about 27 million words, and the socioeconomically disadvantaged families, the children in those households, heard about 13 million words. And so the achievement gap is created. The most fascinating thing to me is the achievement gap, in my opinion, and again, founded upon in part on this research, happens from zero to four before our kids even enter school. And so w- one of the things I'm very passionate about is how do we help the younger kids? And I think that technology, even for younger kids, and certainly to help steward parents, the more technology that's in that household, a steward parents to have to help with better outcomes for their children, especially the socioeconomically disadvantaged families, I think there's great leverage there to extend, accelerate, and transform the learning for even those most young kids before they even get to school. And I think there, are, you know, again, we could dig into this for for probably a few days, certainly another couple hours on how would we go about doing that. Mm. Um, and I think there are strategies to do that. And that's a space I'm very passionate about and uh, hope to continue, um, you know, along some personal missions to see if we can affect some change there um, here in the States that over the is, next few years. I mean, just dropping that stat is, is really moving for me. Moving. Dan Stoneman, Dr. Dan, Dr. Dan. Dr. Dan. <laughs> Did you just say that for the first time? I, I think so. I think that is the first time I said it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. All right, thanks for having me. Wonderful to be here. Thank you, Dan. Have you chatted with a CTO lately? Hi, thank you for listening to the CTO Studio. If you don't mind, take a quick second and please rate and review the show. It helps us a lot. Go to thectostudio.com for more information on what we're doing at 7CTOs. We also have a video or two for you that could be a helpful resource for you as you're managing your company. So. Thank you for listening.